This is TV Ontario. I'm just torn. I, I, keep, I keep coming back to that. I'm just torn by the job. It just... I, okay, I've got the mortgage and the wife and the kids and that, but... Doctor, what... What, what they call chemical research is it's defense. Well, I strongly suspect it is, and okay, all right. The money is excellent, and I've got a wife and a you know, family and a mortgage and everything. I just don't think I should let the money be the deciding factor, you know. So I'm torn, I'm torn. Dr. Nemrova, what would you do? Have I run over time? I don't think so. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave the job. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll go for a walk now. patient changes. I wait so long for a patient to change and now one changes and immediately challenges me. I thought I had my super ego more under control. Rubbish! I've been making you feel guilty for 36 years. You've always wanted to be a very, very naughty boy and you know it. What would you do? The money's excellent, but what would Mama say? It's a matter of principle. And what would Papa say? You can't not earn money. You've got a wife and kids to support. And he and the kids. I miss them so much when they're away. She didn't phone last night. Why? It's worry. Oh, it's a well-known phenomenon. Separation anxiety. It doesn't help knowing that. Perhaps I need to talk to Frida. She can be so damn irritating and boring, Frida, but I love her. Just like her to live in America. What would she do? No, Milos. The world is divided into two types of people. No, 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 no. I hate it when I preach. I'm starting to preach and I hate that. Let us just say that the world is divided into two types of people, those who divide the world into two types of people and those who don't. It's so long since we walked and talked together, isn't it, Milosh? Yes, I know, but you're looking marvelous, Frida. Don't talk nonsense. I'm looking old and tired. You are sitting and thinking that I'm looking old and tired. You must remember that I have some perception, you know, Milosh. I'm a psychoanalyst, too. A patient once said to me, Dr. Tannenbaum, you come out sometimes with the most remarkable insults. Ah, in insights. Well, that has stood me in good stead all these years. My perception, my insights have helped me to become the sexy 83-year-old widowed success you see before you now. It's also helped to have the right accent. You know, Frida, yes, Milos, I know. You are having conflicts. Oh, Frida, it's just that... Milos, Jung said there are no problems which are insurmountable. We just outgrow them. As a neo-Freudian, I would never read a Jungian book. I got that from a fortune cookie. When I was at school, you know, they used to tease me because my name, it means immoral, Nemrava, you know, in Czechoslovakia. I know where you come from. You seem to forget that I spent many years sending you chewing gum and blue jeans. I know where you come from. Your name means immoral. Hmm? I'd never have believed that of your mother. You, yes, maybe, but not your mother. But when God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, he said, where now will I hide human divinity. And then an angel turned to him and said, God, hide human divinity inside each person. That's the last place they look. For me, 
psychoanalysis is a means whereby people are helped to find that divinity. Psychoanalysis has never been about money. Take the money, Porsche, holidays, good food. Trouble about you is you used to be a passionate man. You've forgotten about your basic instincts, your id. You don't like something, kill it. If you do like it, eat it. And on a more sophisticated level, if you do like it, f*** it. Yeah. Don't repress me, because if you repress me, I play little tricks on you and you least expect it. For instance, have you ever wondered where all the odd socks go? They go the same place the Kens and Kensels and Notebooks go. T. E. And that's only for starters and mate. How the devil did that get here? Hello, Milosh. Unexpected guest in your mind, no? Professor Sigmund Freud here. Quite a coincidence, is it not, Milos, that I was born in Freiburg in Austria and you were born in Pripo in Czechoslovakia, the same place. Did you know that the composer Gustav Mahler was born there too? Incidentally, I analyzed him in 1910. Mother fixation, but don't worry about it. In fact, you worry too much, Milos, particularly about our work. As I always said, what you can hope for is you can try to turn hysterical unhappiness into common human misery. That's about the best you can do. See, the main thing is to Keep the patient coming and paying. And between ourselves, the longer the patient comes, the better it is for you. You feel too guilty about the money, you know. The money is a spur to the patient to help the patient find a cure. You know that all human relationships are a market. You get nothing for nothing. Patient once came to me and said, oh, Professor Freud, if only you will cure me, I'll give you all my worldly goods. I said, don't worry about all your worldly goods. Just pay me 30 kronen a week. He said, 30 kronen, that seems a bit steep. If a patient argues with you about money, you simply say to the patient, you are arguing with me about money because of the conflicts you had with your mother and your father. That always works. The other problem you are having, Minosh, is the conflict about remaining objective. But the analyst must remain objective. The objective analyst must present to the patient a blank screen. And onto this blank screen, the patient will project all sorts of loves, hopes, feelings, desires, images, pictures from a past life. Sometimes the patient will become very, very angry with this, with this blank screen. Sometimes the patient will fall in love with this blank screen, no matter how lacking in charm the blank screen may be. But you see, if the analyst keeps his own feelings out of the way, then the clearer the patient's picture will be. Because, you see, we discovered, I discovered, that human beings have not just an urge, have not just a feeling or a desire, they have a compulsion to repeat things. They have a compulsion to repeat things. And if you remain out of the picture, you can see what it is that the patient is repeating. If you remain out of the picture, you can see what it is the patient is repeating. If you remain out of the picture, you can see what it is that the patient is repeating. So, what does it boil down to in the final analysis? I just sit there? What do I do? What do I actually do for the money that I earn? I get paid for remaining objective. At 7.25, I see Sally, I see a woman. She's just had her left breast removed because she had a tumor there. She says to me, I, I don't feel whole, doctor. I don't feel me. I remain objective. 50 minute session, five minute rest. At 8, 20, a man, a surgeon. His wife has just left him. He feels alone. He feels he cannot keep in control, but he has to because every operation he performs is a matter of life and death. He has to keep in control for his job. I know how he feels. 9.15, a woman. Her husband and two children were killed in a motor accident. She feels responsible because she told her husband about an affair she would be having soon. He's having terrible money problems at the moment. I've agreed not to charge her for a while. She has had to sell her house. She's lost her job. She's just had an abortion. 10.10, a borough councillor. 
having conflicts, of course, between her ideals and the practical world, and the ideals always lose, yes. I know how she feels. It's 11 o'clock, I get into my car, go down to the clinic, perhaps have spoonfuls of yogurt at the traffic lights. At least at the clinic, my patients don't have to pay me. At 11.30, I see a young boy, see an, an adolescent. Terribly deprived background, many fights with his parents. He feels he's making progress now because now at least he doesn't want to kill his patients. Uh, parents. But he does think that his parents are wallies. At 12.25, a man, a social worker, problems he's having at his level with the cutbacks here and the cutbacks there. It's absolutely horrendous. And I get the backwash. Trouble is, I don't always like him. But then, I'm like everybody else. I have likes and dislikes. I can like and dislike people simultaneously. Of course. At 120, our woman who lives on our housing estate, she says to the doctor, Doctor, I... I don't want to be dependent on something outside myself. I want to find the strength from within me. Doctor, when, please, when can I come off the tranquilizers? And the doctor says, in 10 years' time. If the doctor would just listen to the patient's problem for 10 minutes more, just listen, instead of writing out a prescription, the doctor would help the patient with that problem and not burden the patient with another problem as well. What a society we live in when people have to pay to be listened to. But I get paid for remaining objective. Get into the car, back to the consulting rooms. At 2.40, I see a research chemist. Uh, you know, I, I, I just I don't think I should let the money be the deciding factor. <coughs> Dr. Nemrova, what, what would you do? Have I run over time? 3.35. I see a dentist. Any moment now, I expect the buzzer. But of course, he's very often late. Sometimes he doesn't even turn up at all. How strange it is to think that a dentist should be afraid of coming to see me. He's on his third marriage now. Feels that his wife somehow is a selfish bitch. And part of me wants to say, yes, of course she's a selfish bitch. She's cleaning you out. She's taking all your money. Part of me wants to say, well, you know, it is your third marriage. Why don't you try and work things out? Sometimes I find the need to uh, pour buckets of cold water over myself to prevent myself from getting involved. At 4.30, I see an insurance salesperson. Very well off materially, but spiritually, of course, bleak as anything. One of those people who wants psychoanalysis but doesn't want psychoanalysis. Well, you're probably the best thing on the market. I'm paying you. Why don't you do something for me? 5.25. A demolition expert. All the cliches. Things in his life break up. His marriage is crumbling. He brings the most lurid dreams full of bits of bone and rotting carcasses and blood and vomit and excretion. At 6.15, I go home. Home to Annie and the kids. When they're away, I miss them. When they're here, we fight. I'm supposed to be the expert. I'm supposed to know so much and be sensitive and aware. How is it possible that my home could be a battleground? It's possible. It's the middle of the night. It's terribly late. And I'm holding my beautiful boy, Jerry. This little miracle. He won't go to sleep. Jerry, please. Please, Jerry. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, shh, 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 shh. Jerry, please sleep. Please try and sleep. Jerry, please I almost hurt him. I'm supposed to know so much. And I'm almost violent with my own beautiful boy. And I'm playing with the elder boy, Martin. I love him so much. And he says to me, I'm going to kill you if you are not English. He must have learned that at school. I'm supposed to be the expert, know so much, be so sensitive. Is it possible that I can have fights with my wife 
because there are always tea bags in the sink. Now they're away, I miss them. Oh, it's a well-known phenomenon, separation anxiety. It's like a child missing its mother. Mama, what, what, what was Mama trying to say through the window of the train when, when I left? What was, what was Mama trying to say? I'll never know. Cable for Miloš Nemrova, 27th of February, 1976. Regret your mother, Natalia Nemrova, died this day, 27th of February, 1976. Commiseration stopped. Annie and the kids were away then, too. <sighs> Don't think I can face going home again, all alone, to that empty house. Milosh, so glad you could make it. You're looking a little bit tired, Milosh. We thought you needed bringing out of yourself. Do come in. Do, do you know everybody? Everybody, this is Milosh. Milosh, this is everybody. Anyway, you meet them. I understand you're a psychoanalyst. Are you married? No. Oh, I bet your wife finds you hell to live with. Psychoanalyst? Oh, I'd better be careful what I say. <laughs> I understand you're a psychoanalyst, Milosh. What else do you do for money? You read palms as well. Hey, man, psychoanalysts in the States, that's a $16 billion industry, man, in the States. Psychoanalysts, they're like assholes. Everyone's got one. Psychoanalyst? Ah, uh, no, I, I'm a regular churchgoer myself. I mean, you can't expect somebody to talk out a cure, can you? I mean, madness is a chemical, isn't it, in the brain, like Virginia Woolf and um, Vivian Lee had. No, 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 they've never isolated a chemical. They once tried an experiment in the so-called mental hospital, they found a chemical that was common to the urine that all the patients were passing. They later discovered it was also common to the coffee that all the patients were drinking. I suppose listening to all those people, you must get some incredible erections. Uh, reactions. I think people are called disturbed when actually they're disturbing. Yes, I think you probably uh, have a point there. I've got this recurring dream. I have it quite often, actually. I dream that I'm falling. Now, if I don't wake up before I hit the bottom, do I die? No, 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 I don't think so. Oh, thank goodness for that. For 20 years, I've been going to bed with a parachute on my back. I think you people get paid an awful lot of money to sit on your backsides all day and do absolutely nothing. Could see that way. What do you do? I'm an estate agent, actually, and I don't think that's relevant. Oh, listen, psychoanalysts have always screwed their patients. You know that. I mean, mentally, financially, and sometimes even physically. Think about it. Therapist, the rapist. I mean, got the patient laying down already. I always find myself defending psychoanalysis as if we can't take criticism. All these stories about Freud and Jung, and the way they behaved, the way they treated women, they're shattering. They're, they're indefensible. I shrug them off. I carry on. Do my best to ignore them. That's right, Milosh. You refuse to think about me. I am a story. Sabina Spielrein. I was brought from Russia all the way to Zurich in 1904 to be treated by the famous Dr. Carl Jung. I was treated by him and very soon I am well enough to attend the university. I become his friend. I begin to study psychoanalysis. I become Dr. Jung's colleague and then he becomes my poet, my beloved. And things are as they usually are with poetry. Four years later, there is a scandal. Milosh, I was not married. Jung was. But it was my reputation that was besmirched. My mother wrote a deeply heart-rending letter to Dr. Jung. And to that deeply heart-rending letter, Dr. Jung replied. Frau Spielrein. You do realize, of course, that a man and a girl cannot possibly continue to have friendly dealings with one another without the likelihood that something more may enter the relationship. 
uh, doctor and his patient, on the other hand, may have the most intimate discussions whenever they like. The doctor knows his limits and does not cross them because the doctor is paid for his restraints. My fee is 10 francs per session. Yours, Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. See, my parents had not given him money because Dr. Carl Jung, as an employee of the hospital, would not have been allowed to take it. They have given him gifts all along. But the important part of the story, Milos, is not about money. And now that I am dead, I can be less modest. I worked with Dr. Carl Jung for four years. And all or most of the important central Jungian doctrines are owed directly or indirectly to me, Sabina Spielrein, including such notions as the animus, anima, the idea that inside each woman there is a masculine soul and within each man there is a feminine soul. My contribution to Jung's work has never been acknowledged. We canceled our rendezvous. I went to Vienna in 1911 and began working with Dr. Sigmund Freud. Dr. Freud wrote to Jung about Sabina Spielrein. He said how bright the little one was. Dr. Jung replied, yes, the little one's ideas are good. They demand some revision, but then the little one has always been demanding. Milos, I had begun considering Freud's notion of the libido, the life force, the desire to create, to construct, to bring together, to promote life. I had realized that this was in conflict with another force, the death instinct, the desire to kill or to die, to tear apart, to destroy, to injure. I delivered a paper about it. This idea became a central Freudian doctrine the notion of the conflict between the life force and the death instinct. This contribution, too, to Freud's work was also never acknowledged. That's the way the pioneers of our profession behaved, Milos. They were so jealous, so selfish. They fought so much, they argued so much, they could never work together. It is tragically ironic that they were the ones telling us that we are at war between each other because we are at war within ourselves. Hi, Miss Berman, it's Elm. No, Miss Berman, I mean, this conflict do start at this stage, believe you me. You do have problems here. I mean, imagine me, much. I'm one of 200 million. Can you imagine? One of 200 million. I really don't like those kind of odds, man. And then, you know, you've got a lot of conflict too, because what do I do? Do I do a bit of fancy stuff? Do I swim a clean race? Or do I fight and struggle and fight and struggle and go for egg? It's a real problem. Hey, get out of the way. Oh, God. I hate it when they stick on your tail, you know. I mean, that's the thing. But either way, whatever you do, you see, the other problem is, man, can you imagine what it feels like? You know, you're going to judge a good tactical race, and then it comes to the end, and you start really going. You kick off, and you move, and you struggle, and you fight, and you move, and you reach, and you land, and swing, and fight, and swing, and fight, and fight, and swing, and swing, and after all that fun, you're fighting, suddenly you're fighting, you come second! Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, conflicting, conflicting feelings. feelings, yeah, I mean, me and, and oh, I, the rest, rest of us, I mean, we're spent, spent, you know, I mean, wasted. Oh, the winner. No, all credit to him, Norm. Fought a great race. Great race. But, uh, now, uh, good luck to him. All right, Mrs. Nemrova. Yes, it's been some time. Nine months, in fact. And now, well, the moment has arrived. We have to do two things simultaneously. Yes, like so much in life. You have to relax completely and push with all your might. Relax and push. Relax and push. Is it breathing, nurse? 
I don't think so, Doctor. Well, in an existentialist sort of way, I've been chucked into the world, so I've decided really to get on with it, actually. Good world, good world. Mummy's just going to move you to the other breast now, darling. Bad world, bad world. Good world. Bad world, bad world, good world, bad world, good world, good world, bad world, good, bad, good, life, death, simultaneously. Uh, <laughs> you're playing. It's, I'm, I'm sort of trying to work out the difference between where me ends and the rest of the world begins. It's quite a difficult distinction, actually. <laughs> And I'm also, I'm also realizing that, that, that there's quite a lot of fluctuation in life between bliss and disaster, which is fairly alarming. <laughs> she, but she... She's going. She's going. She, I, I, I don't realize that she's just going down a passage to garnish the ratatouille. That's my meal ticket, just, just going there. And I start to panic and I start to cry. It's a well-known phenomenon known as separation anxiety, but that doesn't help. I start to panic and things hurt there and they hurt there and they hurt there. And things come out of there and it burns and it feels like. Dying. That there are supposed to be three stages of infancy. And I'm at the oral, oral, oral stage. It's a really good stage, and you put everything in your mouth. But they say, no, 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 naughty, no. I don't even know what the hell naughty means. It's really good, though. It's really educational, and it tastes really, really good. Mmm, fantastic. Very good indeed. Mmm. Mm, mm. I'm at the anal stage. It's a really good stage, actually. But, I mean, talk about conflict at the same time. God, oh, you wouldn't believe the amount of bumps that comes out about the anal stage. Incredible. I mean, people write whole books about, you know, toilet training and number twos and khaki poos and things like that. Supposed to be responsible for excessive thriftiness and obsessional neurosis and political affiliations, the national characteristics of the Japanese. I find it quite fascinating, actually, the whole thing. I do find it quite fascinating, but a lot of people don't find it interesting at all. Excuse me! I'm about to pass a motion over here if anyone's interested. It's pathetic. No one gives a shit, you know. I'm at the genital stage. It's quite a good stage for resolving conflicts. But uh, I'm feeling a bit jealous about a few things that are going on around you. Anyway, we have to see things turn out later, but got to get on with a bit of conflict resolving. I don't care if anyone thinks it's dirty. Is it dirty? I want to be with my mummy 25 hours out of 24. I want to be with her all the time. I want to find out things about her. And I want to be with her because it's joyful and it's interesting and so amazing. And I want my daddy out. He's a dangerous rival. I want him out, out, out if necessary. I will kill him and my siblings, my brothers and sisters. I want them out as well. They shall be banished and all their goods shall be confiscated. There is a danger that my... Daddy could cut off my Willy Wonky Woo, theoretically. But I'm not taking any chances. I'm a very shy little girl, and I'm supposed to have penis envy. <laughs> but I'm at the pre-verbal stage, so I don't know that word. In any case, I've never even seen a f***ing penis. Patient's half an hour late. I can't do a thing without him. Oops. 
irritating, uh, even though I'm going to charge him, but, but it, 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 it's not that that's upsetting me. This patient is very often late. It's dentist. It's, it's, it's the other patient, research chemist, challenging me. <sighs> Can't even go for a walk. I'm stuck here. Session after session, 50 minutes after. Why, why are our sessions 50 minutes? You see, I, I never even asked that. It's a given of our profession. Why did I stop asking why? When did I stop asking why? Milosh Nemrava, Milosh is bad. Milosh Nemrava is bad. All right, children, stand in line. Now, as you know, our beautiful country, Czechoslovakia, our beautiful, please, Milosh Nemrava, Pavel and Eva, will you stand still? Our beautiful country, Czechoslovakia, has been infested by an accursed pest, the Colorado beetle. Now, we will go through the crops and we will save our beautiful country from this pest and we will sing as we go. Milos Nemrava, comrade, you're not singing. You capitalist imperialistic beetle, go home. You capitalist imperialistic beetle, go home. Milos Nemrava, comrade, how did your plant grow to be taller than the others? Comrade, because I, I gave it more, gave it more. Milos Nemrava, don't lie to me. Your plant is probably older than the others, or else you have exchanged your plant for someone else's in an older group. Milos Nemrava, if you have exchanged your plant for someone else's, you are in grave danger of failing. Milos Nemrava, uh, what, what does your painting mean? Uh, my, uh, what, whatever you like. What does it mean? Uh, comrade, it is a, it, it, it's a table and a chair and some fruit. And the lines? Milos Nemrava, what, 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 what do those lines mean? The lines are the things that, uh, they, what have, they are things that, uh, comrade, they are things that people have drawn on the table. Milos Nemrava, are you aware that you are in grave danger of failing? Milos Nemrava, you have yet another question? Hmm? Comrade, I understand everything, comrade. I just don't understand why... The verb to be does not take the accusative case. Milosh Nemrava, one cannot be the subject and the object of the same sentence at the same time. Can one? Can one be subjective and objective at the same time? When we laugh, comrade, and inside we laugh and outside others laugh too. We can see that and... Even one who does not laugh can see that the others are laughing and inside can know that the joke could be funny. And so, objectively and subjectively, we all share a joke. Milos Nemrava, do you realize that you are in grave danger of failing? Milos? Yes, Eva. I don't want to be with you anymore. Why, Eva? Because you are sad and boring and you ask stupid questions. I want to be with Pavel. Pavel? Yes, Pavel. I love Pavel. Milos Nemova, go home, quickly. Your father is very ill. Hello, Milos. Uh, I'm afraid your father has probably had it, Milos. Now, when I tell you I want you to breathe into his mouth, do you understand me, Milos? Yes, comrade doctor. How old are you, Milos? I'm 17 and a half, comrade doctor. Milos, breathe. Milos, wait. I'm kissing my father. I have not kissed my father for so long, and now... I kiss him now when it is almost too late. Milos! I'm afraid your father has passed away. Shall I tell you? No. Comrade Doctor, I will tell Mama. Comrade Doctor, Comrade, an, an hour ago, I gave my father some fruit salts, Comrade. Comrade, the fruit salts. Is that what did it? Milos Nemrava, 
Your uncle and grandfather were not members of the party. Therefore, you will go to the army. <laughs> what is it in me that makes me do this? How is it possible that I can do this? Why do I obey? I never want to be in this position. But I obey orders without questioning. <laughs> Just a Hessian bag filled with kabok. But it could be a human being. I stab with such intensity and yet remain detached. What is it in me that does this? I want to find out. But one cannot study the human mind in this country. Now it is autumn, 1968. The Russian tanks are here. Mama, I hear there are people in Prague who talk to the troops. They say, soldier, why are you here? What, what are you doing here? There are people in Prague who have the guts to lie down in front of the tanks. I want to go to Prague. Then Mama and I agree perhaps it would be better if I went abroad where truth has a chance. I could be useful, I could bring opposition from without. There is our friend Frida in America, the psychoanalyst. So brilliant. As a psychoanalyst, I could be useful. Frida has written that inside each human mind, there is all humanity. But it's also true that I am relieved to be going. I want to live, breathe. Almost deserted. Mama has come with me. I've been dreading this goodbye. Holding Mama, I feel like a child again. Is anyone watching? Mama's coat is worn. She smiled that way when Papa died. I get onto the train, even though we're early. I want this to be over now. I want the train to move. The train must move now. What is Mama trying to say? What are you trying to say? The train starts. What is Mama trying to say through the windows of the train? I can't hear, Mama, I can't hear what you're saying. Is she praying? I don't know what she's trying to say. On me, there are people crying. I cannot cry. I love this country, my people, and I hate them at the same time. I ache to stay, and I long to go. I run away. And one month later, in Vienna, I come across the words of a Russian poetess. I am not under some foreign sky. I am there with you, my people, when it happens. Then, one evening, early evening, not so long ago, in London, Annie and I are in a restaurant, and the food is disgusting. And I say to Annie, you know, in Prevo, the food is very often disgusting too. And I've spoken to the restaurateurs, the chefs there, and they say, well, comrade, we don't earn a profit. The state pays us the same money, whether the food is edible or not. I say, but here in London, they earn a profit. So what's their excuse? Annie says, well, here in London, they cook the food just well enough for the profit and no better. I say, that's the sort of attitude that made me avoid America. Then we agree, Prebo, London, America, it's the same problem. They don't really care about their work, most people. They, they don't really love the work for its own sake. Yes, I say, the world is crying out for the inner. Proof again, if proof were needed, that all over the world, I say, they are guilty of excessive materialism. They are guilty. And he nods. I sweat. But what else was in my mind that 
afternoon when I waved goodbye to Mama, when she tried to talk to me through the windows of the train as it slung towards the capitalistic West. Did I not think of the comforts I would find? What bloody right do I have to complain about how materialistic everyone is? Me, a well-paid psychoanalyst, sitting in a restaurant which, though bad, is by no means cheap. There is so much materialism in the world, I say. I can't get through all the matter to people's minds. I am people, too. There is too much matter on all our minds. That is the matter with all our minds, that money is the matter on everyone's mind. I, uh, I don't think that I should let the money be the deciding factor. Uh, I think I'm going to leave the job. Dr. Nemrava, what would you do? What would I do? Sometimes in a session, everything grinds to a halt. There's nowhere to go. What can I possibly do? What contribution can I possibly make? I, who started out so determined to do something useful. I see perhaps 17 or 20 people in a week. And most of them are happy to pay me. They want to pay me. And paying me is a spur to help them to find a cure, even if they start out thinking it's like giving in church as if one can buy spiritual well-being. Of course, it is worrying that after they've been helped to help themselves, they have to go out, deal with people, have relationships. There's a world out there where other people are uncaring and detached and so on, but, but it's not that come off it, Milos. You know perfectly well that if one person changes inside, that does change the whole world. And this research chemist, my patient, he has changed. He is dealing with the world outside there. He hasn't lost himself. What about me? What do I do? I know I shouldn't be detached myself. Annie says there are times when she feels I stop caring altogether. It's so ingrained, that way of thinking. I find myself endlessly justifying myself, reaching for reasons for doing or not doing what I know I should do, could do. Endlessly rationalizing. I think that's the problem. I analyze everything. I have a confession to make, doctor. It all s started with me, actually. Aristotle, a <laughs> Greek philosopher, in fact. I said, as many of your teacher said that we can explain everything. We can make sense of absolutely everything. I, uh, the thing is, Doctor, that I was a teacher. I was teaching Alexander the Great, the king, and kings like things certain. And uh, so I thought, well, the research grant is too good to lose. What would you do? Anyway, the, the thing is that what I said was that we can arrive at the facts, so to so speak, uh, by argument, by detached, cool, rational argument. You may well say, well, the facts are always in dispute? Well, in fact, they are. Uh, we can have an argument about absolutely everything. Uh, yes, one, one, one can. Uh, there are opposites to everything. That's not true. Yes, it is. Wrong, right, good, bad. So, argument after argument. That is my system, Doctor. Row, row after row after row, fracas after fracas, uh, on for, forever. This affects uh, all our relationships. It affects uh, lovers, <laughs> the ridiculous charade of uh, lovers trying to have the kind of argument that I postulated, which is an argument which people uh, argue with their heads and, and not their hearts. So, so people say, try to be uh, objective, darling. That's just your opinion. Don't get so emotional, sweetie. No, you said no, I didn't. You said did, didn't, did, didn't, and so on. It also affects the way we live our lives. You know those meetings. Everyone knows the meetings when you have an endless debate to see whether to have another endless debate at the next meeting and another meeting at the, which you have another endless debate and so on, on and on and on. Problem is that people then get very tired. And they say, well, why can't we have someone to come in, someone clever to take charge? Trouble is, it's not always someone clever to take charge. It's just someone to take charge. Very often, someone strong to take charge. What I'm saying is my system invites higher authority and it makes underlings of us all because people long for someone to settle it all. Then, those people who do, do take charge, what do they do? They 
take advantage of my system. So you have departments of information that tell people nothing, departments of defense always on the attack, departments of employment that keep people uh, out of work. Uh, double think, then. Uh, this double think dates back to our day, Doctor, Greeks, Socrates, Plato, and so on. Socrates could be a twit in, in that way, and, and the same with people down the centuries of De Descartes. De Descartes. Descartes, he has a person who said, I, I think, therefore, I am, and in fact, that's quite a clottish thing to say, because, uh, you know, he's forgotten about feel. Feel, what about feel? That's the problem, Doctor. Descartes, Socrates, we've had such a profound influence. We are at the very basis of the whole academic system. We are, there is very little argument about that. So, whole generations of students have been brought up to deny the intuitive, the irrational, the emotional, uh, been told that what they are told is the truth, not what they feel inside. And no wonder your patients are in such a state. No wonder you're in such a state, Doctor. The whole educational system encourages conflict. The whole educational system, in fact, uh, drives people mad. And it's all my, my fault. And I'm, I'm really, really sorry. Sigmund Freud again. The reason you are upset is because a patient challenged you. Whenever anyone challenged me, I said, you are challenging me because of the conflicts you had with your parents that always worked. A beautiful system, as good as Aristotle's. Because you never lose your authority. In fact, that is the reason why I will not consent, or never did consent, to be analyzed. I had to operate in an atmosphere where only scientific objective truth would be recognized. I had to speak reasonably, without emotion, about how we should open the gates of reason and allow the emotions to come out. I, like you, I tried many other things, not just cocaine. I was as interested in profound universal love as that cuckoo clock, Jung. I even used telepathy, but all this had to be a private matter between me and myself, rather like my cigar. I, I had to be nothing less than absolutely certain. I had my doubts, of course. How could I have made my discoveries without questioning? But if I had admitted them, I would have been laughed out of court. I had a wife and family. What would you do? Karl Marx, doctor. Each morning, you pass Highgate Cemetery on the way to work. You think of home and you blame me, but I don't think you're being altogether fair, doctor. You know, they only heard what they wanted to hear. You know that problem. Hi, it's true. It seemed to be suggesting that I knew all the answers. But I did not intend to create a spiritual desert in which the state aims to put science in the place of dreams. I wouldn't know how. In fact, I was very interested in dreams, human spirituality. I did say that organized religion is the opiate of the masses, but I also said that we all of us carry a god inside our own chests. Hey, doctor, I also have a confession to make. I seem to know all the answers. I spent so many pages talking about morality or the economics, but at the same time I was making a nice bit of money on the stock exchange, even though I was criticizing the grasping capitalist profiteers. But yeah, I had a wife and family, Doctor. What would you do? Good day, Herr Doctor. Martin Heidegger is my name. I am a tall existentialist philosopher, or at least I was. Doctor, I was another Westerner who said we should try to be more Eastern, and I might add long before that book that you are so boring about Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. I said we should not try to master so much. We should just let it be. In fact, that song was a hit about the time that I died. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. There will be an answer if you'll only let it be. That one. But I have a confession to make, Doctor. After all the things I said about mastery and so on, in 1933, Freiburg in your hometown, it was then called Freiburg, I made a speech in favor of the Nazi party. But I was chancellor of the university. It was a good job. What would you do? Hello, Doctor. I suppose you could say I'm a fellow Czech. Franz Kafka, doubts. Don't talk to me about doubts. I had conflicts about my work too, Doctor. Questioned it all the time. Somebody said I embody the modern Western mind. And I did have great difficulty in loving. Everything in my upbringing and education made it so difficult to love. And I also knew two things, with certainty and at the same time, that there is no God, and that there must be God.
Hi. What's the matter with being lost? Buddha here. You could say that spirituality is an interest of mine as well. <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't really like my popular image. You know, I'm not all lilies of the field, though. I think the way the world is, in fact, Milosh, that people should be really pissed off, actually. But happily. Especially happy because, you see, among the most touching qualities that human beings have are the capacity to change and the ability to love. But the problem is, he who does not know speaks. He who knows keeps silent. I mean, having said that, I mean, it's just that the greatest enlightenment comes from the greatest doubt. Which is where I come in. Adolf Hitler. I was in Vienna at the same time as Freud. It was a time when people thought God may be dead, and if God is dead, then everything is possible. Nothing is immoral. People became terrified, terrified of the freedom, and I realized how easily freedom could be taken away from people. And when all the freedoms are gone, how grateful and relieved they became. Grateful to have someone to tell them what to think. When people repeat your propaganda with conviction, that's when you're really cooking with gas. People want someone to be their will. Frida, you are thinking of doing something else, of making a greater contribution. Yes, I was thinking, I don't Perhaps education, Frida. You know, in some countries, they have just needed to take over four departments, army, police, information, and education. In some countries, they have just needed to imprison ten writers, and the rest will follow. Helping people to help themselves, to think for themselves. You want your contribution to be helping people to be more human. Is this just a pipe dream? Or will you really do it? And if you do it, will you expect some reward? Milos? Of course, psychoanalysis is just one means, among many, whereby people are helped to stand on their own two feet. In this case, by lying on a couch. It shouldn't be the deciding factor, the money. I think I'll leave the job. Thank you. I'll go for a walk now. They made us walk. They pushed us through the gates of Auschwitz and they said, you will walk. You will walk all the way to Buchenwald, across the snow. They shoved us. As I went, I looked at the piles of bodies there. And I thought, there are many brave people there, people who have given their lives. And then I realized that the world is divided into two types of people. Those who will give you their last crust of bread, and those who will bite and kick and fight and do anything just to survive. To survive for what? To lose their humanity? I look around and I see the people who have survived, people around me who have lived. And I must say, Milosh, as we walk along through the snow, I start to despair. After all this time of surviving, that was the first time that I really despaired for all of us. Strangely, I look down at the snow. It's like a carpet in front of me, soft. And I wish to go down there too almost as if I'm falling down into a bed. I stumble down into this snow, and then I fall just for relief and rest. Someone is there. Someone is holding me up. Someone is there. Who is this?
Someone is there. Someone is there. Someone is holding me up. Someone is saying, walk, 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 live. Who is this person who is saying to me, walk on? And we walk on through snow. I hold onto her. I lean onto her for miles and miles. We walk together, I leaning on her. Soon I get some strength from somewhere and she can lean on me for a while. And we walk on through the snow, mile after mile. We walk for days. And we reach the other side. We find some food, a bowl. Someone has managed to give us a bowl of soup. I don't know where it came from. And we are worried. How are we going to share? this bowl of soup. I am hungry. She is hungry. We are desperate. We are decayed. And I don't want to eat the soup too quickly because I will deny her some. She does not want to do that either. What is the solution? What will we do? We feed each other. I correspond with this person. One day she writes to me about those times, about how it was that she managed to survive. Not only those years, but also that walk and pull me through it too. She quotes a philosopher who said, if you have a why for life, you can stand almost any how. She wanted to live for her tapestry, her writing. She wanted to start a family. So did I, and I had my husband and my work that I wanted to go back to then. You know who that woman was, Miloš? It was your mother, Natalia Nemrova. And that's the question. What is your why for life? And is it worthy of you? Next patient.